Listen, I'm going to tell you right now, if you were born anytime, especially anytime up until like the early 2000s before parenting pedagogy started to maybe change a little bit, you're fucked up. I promise you. Period. Point blank. Like. <laughs> Hi, and welcome to According to Weeze, the podcast with me, your girl Weeze. This is a show where we're going to have candid conversations with the hopes of finding a way forward in community. See, fundamentally, I believe that we exist at the intersection of our complex identities, politics, and our sociocultural systems. And let's be real, the only way to dismantle it all is to dissect it. So get cozy, get comfy, and let's dive in. Hello, hello, hello. We're back with another episode of According to Weez, the podcast. Today, I am honored as usual, as I always say, because I'm just really fucking lucky to be in community with some dope ass humans. Honored to have today's guest. I joked about this before we were recording, but really when I think about you, I think of just like a magical human. <laughs> if you are not familiar with the magic of one Elizabeth D'Alto, I suggest you buckle up, get yourself some tea, maybe some coffee, whatever it is you like to drink, whatever bevy, sparkling water, and, you know, remove all distractions because you're welcome in advance. <laughs> Best intro yeah, you ever. Like that? You're Thank welcome you. in advance. Thank you so much. Well, I say that because, and people will will understand this when we jump in, and I'm going to kick it to you in a second, but I'll add a little bit more to this. There are very few people in this world that I think, or at least that I have seen and come across in the interwebs and in my personal life, that are so truly honest with who they are, whether it be like, hey, I fucked up in this thing, right? Like, and I'm a messy full human, or like, I really believe this thing, and also I'm figuring it out. And like, just like we talked about, right, in the in the Wies and Air, but also are like so intentional about joy and their impact in the world and the way that they make other people feel and just like it's it's a rarity. It's a rarity. And so I think that, you know, sometimes we do things or we listen to podcasts and we have 50, 11 million other things going on. Mm -hmm. And this is one that, you know, you can quickly miss a gem because it happens really quick when you're talking to Elizabeth. And you'll be like, oh, shit, that was a whole gem drop. But it was like four <laughs> words. Um, so I want people to like really pay attention because I think you're a phenomenal human. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. So hi. Welcome. Thank you for being here. I'm so excited. <laughs> Good. <laughs> All right, y'all. So the reason that I wanted to have Elizabeth on you know, we hear a lot about, and I'm just going to, we're just going to jump right in and start from the very top. You know, there's a lot of people in the internet streets and the real streets that are doing, you know, embodiment work or, you know, talking about kind of like localizing sensations in the body and like how to understand it and trust your body and intuition and all of these things. I'm not going to say they're doing it wrong, right? Because right and wrong is a, is a binary but I will say that I think that they are not quite taking into account, one, people's full humanity, two, the full spectrum of people's social experience and accessibility, and then three, like, I just think they take themselves too seriously, which is like, whoa, I don't want to learn from you because I'm not having fun. So, mm. <laughs> right? Because, like, what's the point of being alive? And that's something that you do because that's authentically who you are, right? And it like bleeds into your work. That's something that you do and you do it beautifully. So I would love it, obviously, so y'all were talking about embodiment, a la Elizabeth D'Alto. I would love it if you could just kick us off with first, just like what does embodiment mean and why you think it is such an important thing for people to really like learn? Yeah, thank you. So I run an embodiment specialist training. So I'm going to read you actually our definition in the manual of embodiment, because I took the time to create one. So embodiment is simply having a felt sense of connection to your body, including its wisdom, signals, and communication. When you're embodied, you can notice and name your sensations, emotions, and feeling states. On a deeper level, you can perceive your intuition and the presence of spiritual guidance and support. And then for some context, to actually break it down for the word nerds, like the etymology, yeah. the, what is it, a prefix, E-M, comes from the French assimilation, E-N, just meaning in or into, or also put into or into or bring to a certain state. And obviously, we all know what body means. And then meant denotes an action or resulting state. So truly embodiment just means the state of being in the body, which technically we're all always embodied, right? Because mm -hmm. until you're dead, you're embodied. But obviously what we're talking about is the first thing that we set out there. And then the other thing is 
embodiment work is the practice of being in, present with, and connecting to your body. And when I talk about it, there's also this element about allowing your soul to fully inhabit your body. And that's really the thing that a lot of people don't know how to do. And that's really the place where a lot of people go not wrong, like you were saying earlier, but go down a path where it ends up really being inaccessible and excluding people. Because embodiment, based on everything we just said, is absolutely available to anyone, regardless of their body's current size, shape, condition, ability, health, or anything else like that. I love that. I want all of y'all to pause and rewind and listen to that again if it didn't sink in. Because to the point like where the quote unquote people go down the wrong path is that what what I see, right, is a bunch of people using the language, right? So saying embodiment this, embodiment that, but it feels so inaccessible. It feels like you have to either be a certain kind of person or have access to, you know, maybe funds or a certain kind of thing or have a very particular like background of understanding or belief systems to be able to be embodied. Mm -hmm. And inherently in your definition, it's like, to your point, everybody's embodied, right? And so before we kind of dive deeper into that, my brain immediately went to if Everyone is inherently embodied, right? Because we are in our body. And it's really just a question of being disconnected. In your work, right, and what you're seeing socially and with clients and people that you're taking through this process, why are we so disconnected from our bodies if if we live inside of them, right? If we are literally embodied until we die. So one of the things in our definition is about being able to notice and name your sensations, emotions, and feeling states. And a couple of years ago for the website, I wrote an embodiment Bible and I really distinguished between because we use the word feeling and feelings. That's a very like generalizing statement that we use and encompasses a lot. But if we break it down, sensations are literally things we feel in the body, like a tingling sensation, hot, cold, like those things come with sensation. Emotion can be a paired, partnered with sensation. Cause like when we are grieving, like we feel achy in our heart. Like that's a real mm-hmm. thing that we mm-hmm. feel. So there's an emotion and there's a sensation. And then to distinguish between emotions and what I call feeling states, like being tired is a feeling state, being hungry, right? But being like angry, elated, joyful, like if I feel like you're probably familiar with, but if anyone does not look up the feelings wheel, there's essentially only like six to eight real emotions. Mm -hmm. And then Mm -hmm. everything else stems out of those. And depending on like whose feelings wheel you find, they might be different. And I always forget exactly what they are. But even that alone could be life changing for people. Because we live in a culture, especially with the proliferation of social media, that has gotten so lazy and unnuanced with language. Even one of our sayings that we almost all use is feeling all the feels. Yeah. But what are like, how are you supposed to move through and process stuff that's actually getting in the way of you living your life or being in healthy relationships with people or yourself? If we just want to be like, I'm just feeling my feelings. Okay. But what is that? Sometimes we do need to name things, know what it is, and identifying, well, what do you feel and where do you feel it? We can identify patterns. Like, this is how we really can unpack a lot of like familial stuff, cultural stuff, intergenerational stuff, especially for the sensitive people. Like, if you're listening to this, you identify it as an empath or a highly sensitive person, also known as HSP, being able to distinguish the difference between what's yours and what somebody else's mm-hmm. is absolutely life changing. And you don't come to do that without being really in touch with your feelings, emotions, sensations, and all that stuff, which is why I believe, to answer the second part of your question, embodiment is so important because all that stuff's right here in the body. All that information, right? Our inner wisdom, our guidance, what's going on with us, bodies communicating with us 24-7. It's literally our greatest ally, even if you're a person who suffers a lot in or because of your body. Right. A lot of people who have chronic illnesses, injuries, conditions often feel like their body is betraying them and Mm -hmm. your body doesn't betray you. Your body is actually working so hard all day, every day 
to keep you alive. It does more things than you'll ever be able to fathom, imagine, or understand to keep you here. And it just might not do things in the way that you would prefer or the world seems to prefer. Uh And that's where the suffering comes in. And pain is real. Like, pain is real. Like, that shit sucks. And it's hard and it's draining and it's exhausting. But your body's still a miracle. Yeah. It's interesting that you say that because... And I I want everyone listening to like pause and think about a moment maybe in their life that this has happened. Because as soon as you say that, I started grinning because I have my own stuff, right? With like my gut and my endocrine system and all of these things. And when you said my body's betraying me, I was like, whoop, I was that person. You know, like I said that exact phrase, exact phrase to my naturopath. She was like, okay, well, what are, why are we here? I was like, because my body's fucking betraying me. And I was so angry at my body. And this is years before I obviously got on my like healing journey and embodiment and started to like learn that the more that I was angry at my body, I also was like, I was then further exacerbating the pain that it was feeling, the stress that it was feeling, right? All of those things. And when I started to shift to that point that you made, like my body's a miracle. It is literally doing the best that it can given all the things, given, you know, whatever I'm going through or putting in and da, 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 da. And instead when I, like, I had to repattern that, right. Of when I'd be like, I'm so mad at my body today because I can't do X, Y, Z. And it's like, I'm so thankful that my body is capable of at least doing whatever it was able to do at any given day. Mm -hmm. It's wild also how much faster I started to heal, literally like physically heal. The shit works. Yeah. So I would love for you to talk about that because it is, it's real. You know, we've all seen these experiments where people will put like two different jars of water and they'll speak different kind of words to them or a piece of fruit or a plant and be real shitty to one and say mean things (laughs) and treat the other one beautifully and say loving things. And it affects them. Yeah. So if it can affect all that other stuff, what makes you think that what you think about yourself and say about yourself and your body isn't going to affect what's going on with it. Yeah. It's real. Yeah. It's super real. Well, and here's the other thing, like you do anti-oppression work, you do liberation work. So you know that it's not useful to point our arrows at each other Mm -hmm. and be nitpicky about like these minor problematic things. It's the systems that need to get dismantled. Yep. So when you're mad at your body, like there, there are systemic things like there's pollution. There's if you live here in the United States, our fucking food is not even really food. Like <laughs> it's, right, shit, it's so toxic. Everything's yeah. so goddamn toxic. Like everything in my house, the EMF here, like whatever I'm breathing in through my vents, like the dust, the air, like I live in Miami, like the boats I live right by, like the cruise ships, like I'm breathing that shit in every day. Like, It's not your body's fault that you live in this toxic ass world. Yeah. Yeah. And and so this is actually that's a perfect segue to what I was going to ask, because, you know, you've been on That's Not How That Works. And we've had several conversations also. Right. Just the awareness of like what it means to also hold different social identities in our society and then all of the narratives that come along with that. Right. And that's everything from body size to race to right every other identity in between. And so one of the things that I hear you talk a lot about, and I'm sure other people do, but you're my go-to. So one of the things that I hear a lot of people, or I hear you talk a lot about is really this notion of um, like, you say it more eloquently and I'd love for you to elaborate, but it's this idea of like almost turning off the noise, learning to like put on your earmuffs, so to speak, and listen to your own voice and really learn to be like kind and gentle to yourself. Because the the world is constantly going to tell you that you ain't shit for all these reasons. Like, (laughs) obviously, you've listened to other episodes. Y'all know what I mean in a more intellectual way. But that's effectively what the world says. Like, you're terrible. You're not good enough. You're not worthy. And then, you know, more so depending on intersecting, marginalized identities, so on and so forth. And you do a really really good job. I mean, you probably know this. You don't need me to tell you, but you're so good at being able to speak to everyone without making it feel like you're not taking that into account. Yeah. Was there a question? You were just telling me how great it is. Basically, (laughs) I'm I'm giving you your flowers. Sorry. No, I'm giving you your flowers. And I would love for you to just elaborate on that. Like, why is that important to you? How did you get there? The question was at the beginning, but then I started talking about how amazing you are. Sorry. Thank you. (laughs) We all got a little distracted. (laughs) 
because I'm so gonna and I, sorry it's it's true but I'm also being ridiculous about it thank you so I much I mean wait let's pause though because I will say I am in a season of giving everybody their flowers all the time Good. and so yes like you're being funny but also I really want you like no, I own it because I, I will yes, say, good. and I'm going to tell you this in story format. Perfect. I have a student of mine for many years now. I first met her when I ran a workshop in Brisbane, Australia in 2019. And she was just coming into beginning to have a chronic illness, pain in her body and gaining weight and stuff like this. Kind of one of those mystery illness situations, which I'm sure mm-hmm. a, a lot of people can relate to these days. And recently she went and did a yoga teacher training and she was sending me a message to be like, I just, I know this, but it's just so glaring to me being in like this training, how I've never anywhere else in my life felt so included, considered, cared for and loved on than in your classes and in your work. And Mm -hmm. it's interesting because part of my work, there's so much that I've just essentially, for lack of a better way of describing it, just like downloaded, like I don't know how I know what I know. The practices mm-hmm. came through. And then what's hilarious is later on, I'll bump into things like, oh, there's a little element of like kundalini yoga in this. Oh, the whole field of somatics. Like, this is what we do. <laughs> and this is why I believe in past lives. I'm like, how did I know this shit? I must have yeah. been doing it, you know? But I'm not one of those people who's like, in my past life as a priest, <laughs> you know, not that. But listen, if you're like that, great. Like, whatever you believe, as yeah. long as you're not harming yeah. others and oppressing people, I don't care. Right. I believe in some real out there shit. But anyway, my natural inclination to that, I've also always had a natural inclination towards inclusivity, right? Being like, if someone's in this room having something going on, let's acknowledge it. And that's my answer. At a base level, the simple acknowledgement that someone might not be having the baseline experience is just the easiest way to do that, right? So even, and I'm just, I mean, I've been teaching movement for so many years. I was a personal trainer back in the middle. I'm over, what are we now, 14 years that I've been teaching movement. So I also just time in the field, right? Like, what do they say? You do your 10,000 hours and you're a master. So I've certainly put in 10,000 hours of teaching movement, moving my own body. I started working out when I was 12. So I do have a lot of somatic awareness Mm -hmm. of what might be going on in my own body, what might be going on in other people's bodies. And so it's really easy for me any given moment, if I'm leading a practice to just acknowledge like, Hey, we're in our shoulders right now. If your shoulders are stiff, you don't have to do like feel something else, find something else. So there's the way of doing that in the body so that literally any body can access the tools and practices, the modalities that I teach people for getting out of their head and into their body physically on a physical level but then it's the same thing with mental emotional spiritual whatever just simply acknowledging like hey you might not agree with this but so listen with your ears for what is the truth that's here for you what Mm -hmm. is the insight that you came to get today because that's also the other thing that i'm a huge advocate and stand for and i think is a huge piece of collective healing and liberation we really got to get people indoctrinated into critical thinking. Yo. People need to be able to hold paradox. Mm-hmm. Multiple things could be true at once. Mm-hmm. And accept that we can accept things the way they are while still wanting to change them. Because all, a lot of this language that people use, even the word anti, I have like a minor issue with energetically. But, Mm -hmm. you know, in some cases, I'm like, whatever, it it just is the most accurate term. It's fine. Mm -hmm. But all this like fight against like that energy, kind of like what you were saying earlier about my body is betraying me. Well, when you shifted to damn, my body's doing everything it can given these Mm -hmm. conditions and what's up. Thanks to my body. You know, when when we can accept stuff and even though we still want to change it, like acceptance is not approval. Mm -hmm. And then speaking of the word approval. If we can find a way to approve of ourselves, no matter where we are in the journey and accept that, of course, certain things are hard for me. Of course, that person's good at that. Like we are all so unique. There is so much complexity and diversity in the world. This like comparison thing that people do, I think unhooking from social norms is one of the most valuable things we could do because then we really can look at ourselves and be like, oh, look at me. I'm built for this. I'm not built for that. We could get more into, and I will talk about this so often until the day I die, the difference between judgment and discernment, right? Judgment is where all the evaluations come in. 
this is good, that's bad, better, worse, right, wrong, this, that. Discernment is just compatibility. This is for me or this is not for me. That works for me, Mm -hmm. that doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. And we can also save how much mental and emotional energy not needing to like nitpick, pull apart, analyze, and spend so much time talking about all the shit we don't want, don't like, don't have, doesn't work for us. We could be like, what is here? What is present? So I feel like I answered your question and then went on my own little tangent. I love it. That's just like we were having a regular conversation. (laughs) I want to repeat something that you said. Acceptance is not approval. I really want to make sure people didn't miss that. Acceptance is not approval. And I think that's so important. And I so and I want you to to elaborate on this, right? I think that's a really important thing for people to understand, especially right now. We are living in what I would consider some of our most like sociopolitically tumultuous times only because the internet has allowed yes. everybody with any kind of opinion to publish and post and tweet and, you know, whatever. Yeah. Right. It's really bad. And so before, you know, the advent of the Internet in this way, you could use your discernment lens to figure out like, eh, these people are not for me. This space is not for me. I'm just not going to subject myself to it versus now you don't really have a choice. Like I show up on the Internet and I'm like, why are you showing up on my timeline? Like, no, no, no. See less of this. Right. And so I have to like actively do that to kind of like clear out my space. Right. But all of that being said, I find there's a lot of tension and a lot of conflict that arises because of it. And a lot of tension and conflict that I see people holding in their body because they have yet to figure out that you can accept the fact that people are going to post and say wild things. Like we know that All the isms are real. We know it exists. We had a whole president who was out here campaigning off that. You know what I mean? Like it's it's real and true. Hello. I can accept that that's a reality without it meaning that I approve of it. And that does something to my nervous system. Yes. Right. And so I would love for you to dive a little bit deeper into that, because I think that that is like at least I know my listeners are all people who are like, okay, I want to quote unquote fight the good fight, right? Like I want to be here trying to move the needle of equity. And this is something that I see them battle with a lot of the times. And this is why I try to teach them, right? Protect your peace. But I think the element of the acceptance and not approval and what that does to the nervous system really gets to the core of how to and what it can look like. So how to and what it can look like. So funny because I was, I was, as you were saying that, I'm like, yeah, and you, you say protect your peace all the time. That's where the peace comes from. Acceptance, even compassion. And so I have another little distinction that you'll probably like, which is compassion also is not the same thing as tolerance. I can say have, that one again, please. Yeah. <laughs> compassion is not the same thing as tolerance. And I do need to credit a person who I used to follow her work back in the day. I don't anymore, but I got that distinction from Danielle Laporte. Okay. So I do need to give her the credit, although yeah, yeah, I yeah. certainly no longer recommend her work. Right. And these things go hand in hand. And here's where I'm coming from with this. I have an embodied self-love framework. There's five pillars. It's self-awareness, mm-hmm. self-knowledge, self-acceptance, self-trust, and self-respect. And self-acceptance is squarely in the middle on purpose because acceptance is the bridge from being able to observe yourself and become self-aware, knowing who you are, how you're built, what are your values, your priorities. And that acceptance is then going to bridge you into being able to trust yourself and being able to respect yourself. And what's Mm -hmm. cool about the self-love framework is it's self-love, but we could apply it to that's how we love other people too, right? Awareness, knowledge, like know who the fuck people are, accept them as they are, right? Again, which doesn't mean we approve, but I just accept, you know? And I'll tell you another story to put that into context and then trust them or not trust things to be the way they are, Mm -hmm. trust the chips to fall however they will. And then respect, which is like, we can either respect other people or not respect how life functions, you know? So again, we can use that in a self context. We can use that in relating to others interpersonally as well, but the acceptance is not approval. For example, my parents are tough people to get along with Mm -hmm. for me because they just have a lot of stuff that they haven't healed. Mm -hmm. So they're like literally the only two people in my life that might ever yell at me or like communicate with me in a violent manner. And, you know, there's also some other like dysfunctional shit that they do that no one else (laughs) in my life does. Yeah. Cause I'm, 
happy to like walk away from almost everyone except I'm not gonna ditch my I'm just not gonna be one of those people that cuts off my family you know yeah there's too much good there to to walk away so it's a lot to deal with and I don't approve of a lot of their dysfunction and their behavior but I certainly have come to a place over the years of accepting them exactly as they are I don't need them to be different I don't need them to change mm-hmm. right and I, I used to do that was my healing. That's that was part of my liberation of yeah. like not needing them to change, not needing them to be different. Right. Just being like, this is who these people are. This is who and how they are. And you and I have talked about this. I think you posted quotes about this. You know, I have that T-shirt that says, be you, they'll adjust. Yep. Right. And you're like, listen, I'm going to just observe you people and then I, I can adjust. I don't need you to do anything. That's exactly what this is. Right. I don't approve of it. I'm not like signing off on it, right? And I'm certainly not doing the spiritual bypassing that some people do. Everyone's perfect, exactly. No, no. But I accept that this is what it is. Mm -hmm. And I don't need that to be different for me to be okay. And there's a lot of healing to get to a place, a lot of forgiveness work, a lot like all kinds of shit, right? And for you were talking about the nervous system. This is why I believe so deeply in embodiment work and somatics because we have to reprogram the nervous system, mm-hmm. right? It's not just about like flower crowns and dancing with our titties out somewhere <laughs> right? in a group of goddesses. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but if you're not reprogramming your nervous system, it simply does not matter, no matter yeah. how stunning it looks on Instagram. Right. The compassion and tolerance thing, this is important. And here's where I'll tell you a story. My dad recently on my last visit where I was home visiting my parents this was wild. I'm going to give you the details because I don't think my dad will ever listen to this. And if he does, still waiting to have that conversation with you. But I love AOC. Mm-hmm. Is she also problematic? Sure. Who's not? Who's, who's not? not problematic? <laughs> Find me someone. Let me know. Even the Dalai Lama says some problematic shit, right? Yo. So <sighs> my parents watch Fox News. I'm just going to let it sit there for a second. Yeah. Please, please send me your condolences. <laughs> so, I was going to say, do you? what I, do you need? Like <laughs> twice. <laughs> I'm sitting here. I'm sitting in the living room. They put the news on and I'm like, yo, I'm like, you want me to go upstairs so you're done watching this or do you want to change the channel? Like these are the options. Right. And then my mom starts, I don't know, she's just going off about something. My mom is better at agreeing to disagree than my dad. They start talking about something and I don't remember how it came up or why, but I said, I love AOC and they lost it. And I understand why, because if you watch Fox News, AOC is one of the number one people that you are programmed to hate. And there's so many narratives that go with it, whatever. So there was a particular thing. It was the whole thing about how she lied about where she was on January 6th. Mm. And I'm like, y'all, I'm like, I remember this. That was like what she said got really misconstrued, blah, blah, blah. Like I pulled up an article. I texted. I'm like, check this out if you want. I'm like, I remember how the whole thing went down. That's not how it happened. And my dad is like certain that he remembers watching an interview where she actually said it. And I'm like, I'm going to send you this article anyway. I'm pretty sure that's not how it happened. And, you know, my dad has a button. He took that as I was basically I might as well have just been like, you're a fucking liar and a piece of shit. That's how he (laughs) took it. And this man snapped and screamed at me. He's actually never screamed at me like that in my life. Mm. And I was just like, okay. I walked into the other room, packed a little bag, called an Uber, texted my brother, I'm coming over. When the Uber was one minute away, I just yelled into the living room, go to Mikey's. And I removed myself from the situation. And here's the thing. You can tell probably by the sound of my voice, I wasn't even mad. Yeah, I was sad. I had to grieve. I cried later because I was like, Mm -hmm. damn, that was like so it's so upsetting that that's where that person is. Mm -hmm. Right. That that's how that had to happen. Both my parents texted me, you didn't have to run away. And I'm like, there's a difference between running away and removing myself from a violent situation. Yep. And like I was saying to you earlier, I'm like, nobody in my life treats me this way. Yeah. I don't have to tolerate it mm-hmm. just because you all are my parents. Mm-hmm. So again, I have immense compassion for whatever is the unhealed trauma, the dysfunction going on in there that made my dad snap at me just because I was like, I'm pretty sure that's not what happened, right? I wasn't calling him a liar. I was just like, We know, like, it's the media, like your bait, like we know better than this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And he took, however he took it. And then I also, after that visit, I was like, all right, I have to also now make some new adjustments Mm -hmm. to how I want to visit my parents on what terms, where, 
do I go to their house? Do I go stay in New York and just have them come see me for a day or two? Like, I'm not like, maybe I just don't go under their roof anymore. Like in their energetic turf, there's, there's all mm-hmm. these ways that I'm like, I got to adjust because I'm not interested in putting myself in that position ever again. There's also certain things I'm like, great, good to know. Never bringing up AOC with yes. my parents ever again, you know? Yeah. So answered the question, told a story. What, what <laughs> else? Did I miss anything? <laughs> No, I love I love the recap. Boom, boom, good. I'm a podcaster and I'm a Virgo. I know I Mercury energy. I can't help myself but track it. No, I I love it. I love when other podcasters come on because yeah. you know we're always thinking about that kind of stuff. We're so like, is I any, did it. I leave a loop open? Y- yep, exactly. So you said something that made me actually. I had another question, but I actually, you know, we're gonna pivot because what I'm also hearing is a lot of trust in yourself. There's a lot of like. And, and as you've told a couple stories, right, and just kind of talked, that undercurrent I'm hearing is like, I feel a thing, I'm going to listen to myself. And then it's almost like what I'm hearing is if it was like actually spoken out, it would be like, okay, self, what do I need? And self is like, girl, this is what we need. And you're like, cool, I'm going to give this to you, self. And self's like, thank you. And then we just go do it, right? Like there's no arguing, there's no gaslighting yourself. There's none of that. There's just trust, And that's not something that one we see generally, but it's certainly not something that we're taught to do, right? We're actually, I believe, inherently taught the the opposite. Our intuition, especially like as children, is we are taught to like ignore it. It is almost like socially programmed out of us. Not almost. So most people. For most people. So that being said, how can people like one, what was your journey like to, you know, coming to like trust yourself? Yeah. And two, you know, are there any gems that obviously, and I'm going to put a big asterisk on this. <laughs> if y'all are not entering into the space where Elizabeth, and I can say this because I know you'd say the same, and maybe Elizabeth is not your jam as a, as a guide. Cool. Find someone else. But you need to enter into spaces with people who can guide you through the process of learning how to like repattern and trust yourself and learn the skills and da, 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 and unpack. And so just because you might hear some gems here, please remember that there's no expectation for you to go and be like, cool, Elizabeth, give me five things to do. I can go do these five things. Yeah, that's not how that works. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> I had to put an asterisk on that. Like, Thank you. go hire her. Anyways, now um, back to you. Well, self-trust has actually been a, whole, a huge pillar of my entire body of work for almost a whole decade mm-hmm. now, 2013. Mm-hmm. And what it really is, all those things like that little self, 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 thank you, thank you, we're going to do this dialogue, that's reparenting yourself. That's what that is, right? At a certain point, it actually, I started doing this about a decade ago, it was 2012, when I really dove into my healing work and and started to be able to recognize and articulate what was the dysfunction in my family growing up and the impact that had on me, where I was a mesh, codependent, complex PTSD, like all this crap. Mm-hmm. I shouldn't call it crap. It's like real shit that deeply affected me. <laughs> and if you have those I was experiences, say. <laughs> it deeply affects you too. But yep, <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. I'm the grown up now. Yeah. I get to take care of me. And I really do believe we all have that inner little one that if you see someone throwing an adult temper tantrum, it's a child throwing a temper tantrum in an adult's body. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. It's like, I saw this great meme recently and I, I probably will misquote it a little bit. But it was something like, listen, our triggers are just like ourselves saying to us like, yo, this shit is fucked up and reminds us of something terrible that happened before. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's what a trigger is. So I started learning to give myself some space between reaction. Like I define I know we hear the term all the time. That's a trauma response. Mm -hmm. To me, that's inaccurate. It should be that's a trauma reaction Mm -hmm. because the distinction for me between reaction and response is time. Reaction, yeah. immediate, impulsive, no time. Mm-hmm. And often that's when we're flooded, nervous systems hijacked. We couldn't do anything different if we wanted to. And this is why I can have so much compassion for my dad, though I won't tolerate being treated how he treats me in that moment, is because yep. he couldn't control. That man doesn't want us. That man loves me. Yeah. He, he, he cried about it and apologized later. He doesn't want to fucking scream at me like that. Yeah. But he couldn't not. Yeah. In that moment, because something in his system was so loud and so intense and so whatever. Right. Obviously, healthy fight response in that dude. Yeah. (laughs) And, you know, I don't need to be mad at him for that. But again, I also don't need to tolerate it. But like you're saying, the part of me that is very comfortable reparenting myself goes, cool. What do you need? I need to not be in this house with either of these people right now. 
I need to go cool off. I need to go be in a place where I feel safe or safer. Mm -hmm. I need some space from this. So that's really, that takes that gentle work, like that being like, really, if, if you have a child in your life, whether it's your own child, other people's kids, your friends, kids, nieces and nephews, whatever, maybe you work with children. I always have loved the advice of speaking to yourself, especially in your most vulnerable moments, the way you would speak to a child. And then the, the metaphor I always love is if a little kid is learning how to walk, nobody's being like, come on, you little shit. Why aren't you running yet? People are like, oh, my God, they took two steps. Like, ah! you know, like, yeah. we need to treat ourselves that way as we heal and grow and do better. Right. Like some people yeah. boundaries is something I teach a lot about. So every little tiny boundary win that you ever have, like that's a win. You got to yep. celebrate everything like those little wobbly, chunky thigh steps that babies yes. take when they're learning how yep. to walk. But you're doing it yeah. as a grown up with your voice, with your communication, feeling your feelings, taking care of yourself, tending to yourself. It is such a gentle process. Like I cannot use the word gentle enough because the opposite of that is like what you're describing, how harsh a lot of people are with themselves, especially people who are like perfectionists type like that mm -hmm. learning to be gentle with yourself is so healing, right? Give yourself the love that maybe you didn't get from your family or your community growing up. Give yourself what you crave, treat yourself, not just how you want to treat others and how you want people to treat you, but like you be the model for people in your life of how to treat you. And so here's, what's cool with that situation with my parents that happened recently now they both know you fucking yell at me and I'm out. Yep. Figure out your feelings or another way to communicate or I'm out. Like I'm an adult now. I have money. <laughs> like yes. I got places to be. Listen, like, I am. And, and let's we'll acknowledge the privilege in that. Right. I yeah. could call an Uber. I could go to my brother's yeah. house. I had a place yeah. to go. I had a way to get there. Yeah. That's a thing. Yep. Absolutely. As you're talking, I'm also, you know, and I'm, going to just share what came up for me. And I would love for you if you see an opportunity to elaborate on it. But I'm also hearing the need to be kind to yourself when you do get into those places of, I call it emotional reactivity, right? So very similar when it's like the reactivity is too big for your body. And then later you calm down and you can, if you do have the skills, right, to like reparent yourself and be kind to yourself and, and have that conversation with the little one and say like, hey, what was that about? Like what, you know, what was mm -hmm. kind of like pressed on? What I find is that we've been taught to make that mean something about ourselves and make ourselves bad, right? Mm -hmm. And so because we've been taught to do that to ourselves, we do that to other people. And I found like, for example, you know, in my relationship with Benny, what has been really useful for both of us is that like, we are both full ass humans who have had our own trauma, our own experiences, our own set of parents that, listen, I'm gonna tell you right now, if you were born anytime, especially anytime up until like, the early 2000s before parenting pedagogy started to maybe change a little bit, you're fucked up. I promise you, period, point blank. Like, I wish it was different. Our parents... <laughs> <laughs> before, before the dawning of gentle parenting and free range yes. parenting. Yes. Before that shit popped up, we are all fucked up just to varying degrees. But none of us made it out without needing therapy from yeah. our parents alone. Like there's the rest of life and then there's just our parents. And granted, to your point, they did the best that they could with yeah. who they are, where they're at in their own journey and all of those things. But like we have those conversations a lot and we realize that sometimes our conflict and we're here now, right? More than a year into our relationship that our conflict in the beginning had nothing to do with like each other or us not caring or loving each other. It was like something you did or something you said activated little me, right? It, mm -hmm. it activated old childhood wounds. And in that moment, because I'm still learning you, I don't know if you're safe yet. I don't know how you're going to react to it, right? Like I'm reacting out of trying to keep myself safe. Yeah. And what really changed for us in our relationship was our ability to be able to name that in the moment of just being like, I can't right now, right? We have our own little like emotional safe word, but walking away and then coming back and explaining and talking mm -hmm. through like, this is what like that my inner child was actually doing and why little me had a fucking temper tantrum, right? Like I'll be like, yeah, I was being a brat, right? Or he'll say his thing. And then we can talk about it. And it, it allows us to have these emotional conversations that then, you know, you're not carrying around the like, well, I'm a bad partner or I'm yeah. this or I'm that or whatever. 
And I've found that being able to do that in my own life has allowed me to also learn to like forgive myself, Mm -hmm. right? And also learn to continue to give myself grace. And so I'm saying all of this because as you're talking, I'm kind of like reflecting back of like, yeah, shit, like that one that was like really important for me. And two, uh, spoiler alert, this shit is forever, right? You don't just like (laughs) figure it out and it never happens again. But I would love for you to speak about it from like from that angle, right? Of like Mm -hmm. being kind to ourselves. Like what does that do for us? And what does it mean? And what can it look like to be kind to ourselves even when we're being a full on total demon brat? That's what I call it. I'm like my little demon came out. (laughs) I love it. And I'm I'm also so glad that you did the mirror of like that I did from self-love to being able to love other people before. As you are gentle with yourself, it will also help you to be gentle with other people, right? Like, I'll give you another example. This week on my podcast, it was episode number 399, which is called My Sacred Slut Summer. Because one of the big explorations of my life right now. We could talk. I'm going to see you in Miami okay. next week. We'll I know. I was like, well, I'll finish it. Yep. Go ahead. Um, and this big intentional exploration of non-monogamy right now. And I had an mm-hmm. experience this summer with a married person who did not tell me they were married until after we were intimate. And, mm-hmm. you know, I was sharing the story with a friend and they were like, what an asshole. And I'm like, he's not an asshole. Mm-hmm. He's actually a sweetheart and he has mm-hmm. horrible communication skills. He was Mm -hmm. very smitten with me and did not, like, he really wanted to keep me in his life. I I even remember him asking me, how did your ex let you go? And me being like, Mm. people don't let me go. I leave. Yeah. You know, but that let me know what his mentality was. I'm going to do whatever I can to keep her in my Mm -hmm. life. So I'm like, it is not surprising to me that he was dishonest. He was even in an open marriage. Like he could have told me and it would have been fine. Yeah. I just would have been like, cool. Like, what are the boundaries? Maybe I need to talk to your wife. Like, what's the deal? Yeah. But yeah. I didn't do that because some people, it's not that they won't. It's actually that they can't. Mm-hmm. Right. Their fears of abandonment or rejection or whatever they can't overcome that enough to tell the truth and say the thing and run the risk of the thing they're most afraid of. So they will Mm -hmm. either obscure the truth or Mm -hmm. full out lie. Mm. And again, I'm talking about this person, but we can see how we do that shit too. Right. And another thing I love talking to people like you, because I'm like, let's bring in all the distinctions. This other thing I say all the time is explains it doesn't excuse it. Mm -hmm. which also falls under that compassion versus tolerance thing, right? I understand where the behavior comes from. And so I can have compassion for it. I can accept that that's the way that person behaves. I have to decide how I want to interact with it and then doesn't excuse it. Here's where my level of tolerance is for this, right? And even for that man, I gave him an opportunity to repair it first. And I did that for my own benefit as much as his, Because in the past, I could be very dismissive. I could be like, shitty behavior? Fuck you. I'm out. Yeah. I got me. Right? Because everything exists on a spectrum. (laughs) Yep. So that, like, I got me, I parent myself, can very easily go into hypervigilant, must protect self at all costs, eliminate Uh the enemy, Uh (laughs) like, get this person out of here, you know? Yeah. So I was like, I would like to give you an opportunity to repair this. I don't need to get into the whole story. It didn't end up working out that way. But the way it felt for me, it was very healing to give this person an opportunity to repair from what they had done. And then Mm -hmm. that that's like what we were saying earlier. And then let the chips fall. He's either going to do it or not do it. But I brought my most loving self Mm -hmm. to this situation instead of just Mm -hmm. like cutting someone right out, right off. I got to do that twice this summer. There was another thing. I don't need to get into the story, but it was the same, same. And in that situation too, person couldn't do it. Mm-hmm. They couldn't step up. It wasn't their time. They weren't able to, and it wasn't their time. So these are things that we could look at when we're doing our own personal work and then also extend that grace to others. But again, always coming back to that place. What do I have tolerance for? bandwidth, capacity, energy. What do I feel like dealing with? What do I not? And always remembering that that can shift depending on like the season cycle phase stage of our life and the other things that are going on just might not be a priority at the moment. Yeah. I have a great community here and there's a person I have like a beef with right now. And I was debating whether or not to have a conversation about it. And yesterday I was like, you know what? I don't actually care if that person's in my life. 
I'm totally cool not going to group shit that they're going to because the effort that I would have to put forth to even want to be in a room with them, I just don't be in rooms with them. I don't want to. And I don't yeah. have to, right? So what I was hearing in your question is how do I give myself, how do we give ourselves this grace without overly internalizing stuff, making ourselves wrong, bad or whatever? And it actually made me want to, it's funny because I have it sitting here. I was reviewing it. There's this book that I've been recommending to like anyone who will listen for years that it's the best copywritten title I've ever heard. It's just straight up called Adult Children of Emotionally Immature Parents. For parents. It's an amazing book. It's an I recommend it book. to everybody. Yeah. And, and one of the things is you're asking the question from like the people who internalize, mm -hmm. right? Because there's two different types of uh, people that they say from that book. If you have emotionally immature parents, you might be an internalizer, an externalizer. Some of us turn it in and go, I'm bad. I'm wrong. What's wrong with me? Other people go, they blame it on everyone else mm -hmm. and take no responsibility. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's both things. Right. But mm -hmm. either way, what needs to get resolved isn't getting acknowledged, resolved, owned and and like brought into like a loving space where it could be unpacked and healed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that book changed my life because I'm an internalizer. Me too. <laughs> And I had to learn that it really gave me the language and the framework to understand like, and you said it earlier, right? That's not mine. Mm -hmm. This is mine, right? Like, yes, I think everybody, I, I recommend it to everyone too. As soon as you started saying it, I was like, yes, I tell everyone to read this book. It's a great book. Everyone needs to read this book. Even if you don't think, like I said, if you were born <laughs> yeah. time before. Well, I said, if you were born <laughs> pre-2000, read the book. So, okay, before I take a little bit of a left turn, because this episode is going to be coming out probably in the next like two weeks, is there anything before we wrap up that you're like, I really just want people to know this about embodiment, embodiment work. And then I have a second part to that question after you answer that. Yeah, truly embodiment is for everybody. Okay, I don't care what you look like, where you came from, size, shape of your body, the condition, the health, like again, whether it's me, whether it's somebody else, like find a space where your body can be honored because one of the most important ingredients in my work that I'm constantly getting reflected to me is different than other embodiment bodies of work is body reverence. Mm -hmm. It's that thing that we talked about earlier. The body is a miracle mm -hmm. and every, everyone's body is a miracle. This is one of the things that I love about running my embodiment specialist training I love teaching my future teachers and facilitators how to be inclusive because I also get to watch them heal as I tell that like when I'm talking about, for example, how to cue things for people with larger bodies, the women with larger bodies are being included as I'm teaching that and they're healing as they're hearing it. Mm -hmm. It's this beautiful symbiotic like my body is OK and I can teach and I don't have to be self-conscious about like, it's just, and if, if there's a space that makes you feel like your body is not just as worthy as everybody else's body in the space, that might not be the space for you. That's not something you should have to tolerate. We shouldn't have to sift through the trash to get the gold. And that's what a lot of bodies of work are like out there, Yeah, depending on who's yeah. teaching it. And that's a perfect segue to the second part of my question. If I'm just starting out, I'm listening to this episode and I'm like, okay, Abby, I'm going to follow Elizabeth D'Alto, but maybe I want to, you know, start to develop a little bit of a discernment lens, right? Because I'm following you because we said so, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I don't know what I'm looking for, right? What would you tell me? Like, what are a couple things that I can look for to, to really make sure that it's not, you know, goddesses in the field dancing, only, right? Again, nothing wrong with that, but like yeah. only or doesn't include like the body reverence or those types of things. And maybe I'm not confident enough yet to just like slide in the DMs and be like, yo, here are my questions, right? But I want to like start to look. Are there any kind of telltale or key signs that I can look for? You're looking for green flags? Is that what this question is? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I like to orient towards green flags. If you can think of explicit red flags, if you prefer no, no, to answer no. I like, like to that. orient towards green okay. flags too. Okay. Well, case in point, everybody... How do you feel in your mm -hmm. body when you are engaging with people's work, people's content? Now, I got to put an asterisk on that. And here's why. 
I'm, I'm sure we, is, I have a feeling you probably get this feedback all the time. People have been telling me I'm intimidating, like practically since I was a child. And I'm like, I'm a child. I don't know why you're <laughs> I don't even afraid. Know how to like, talk yet. <laughs> <laughs> like, what the hell? And so I want you to suss out that difference, right? Because there is, if you feel intimidated, it's because you feel intimidated, not because we're intimidating. Uh, that mm-hmm. distinction is also very important to me. I'm not intimidating. Weeze is not intimidating. You feel intimidated, right? If you feel intimidated, that's okay. But if you can tolerate that, and that's important too, right? Because in trauma healing, there's this thing, the window of tolerance. If you can tolerate like the feeling of feeling intimidated and stay present with what's there for you and feel into the what's there for you, not like how you're personally feeling about the teacher. Mm -hmm. And again, I just need to make sure this is different from someone's not for me, Mm -hmm. right? This is inviting you to own when you're feeling a way about someone because they like embody or have or are a certain way that you're not and that's triggering you. That's different than if you're looking at someone's bullshit and feeling like yuck, right? So there's like the yuck feeling that you want to listen to and be like, that's not my person. And then there's the like, actually, that's what I want. And that's why I feel intimidated. Okay. That might be something that is worth engaging with. Again, if you can tolerate it enough to get to the good stuff. But any really good embodiment work is always going to do two things. Always return you to the basics, right? It's not going to be overly complex when you're just starting out. It's going to be like, cool, you're new. Just learn to feel the sensations of your breath and remember to breathe. Like, let's start with the basics. Doesn't need to be fancy bells and whistles. Like, that's actually one of the beautiful things about embodiment work. Very potent embodiment work. The foundations, the basics are like really the keys. The other thing is it's always going to point you back to your own experience. It's not going to, and this is something that I've struggled with because I'm like, I don't want it to be about me. I'm the type of person who really doesn't want all this attention I'm built to get, which is like one of the big conflicts of my whole life, in every area of my life, personal, professional, romantic, like whatever. So I'm constantly doing this. I'm so happy to like remind people like all this shit that you admire about me, it's because you have it. Like you wouldn't see it. You wouldn't be drawn to it. And not even just in that sense, but You'll see people, and this is a red flag. I'll, pu- I'll give you the red and the green. The green is they're always pointing you back to your own experience. And when they speak about their own experiences, because there's nothing wrong with that. I teach a lot through storytelling, sharing experiences, whether it's my own or students or clients' experiences, because that is a real way for things to land for folks in their own context through a story rather than me just like telling you how to do it, right? Because you could put yourself in someone's experience and see what lands and resonates. But the people that are really like, look at me, look at me, you should want my life. I spend half my podcast episodes being like, y'all, you don't want to make the life choices I'm making. I'm pretty sure most of you don't want to live the way that I live. And I'm not out here trying to like advocate for my choices. I want you to just find your own truth and the things that I share. So those two things, right? Always going to bring you back to the basics and always going to bring you back to yourself. Biggest green flags. I love that. I love that. I love that. All right. Before we wrap up and um, I, this is impromptu and I don't I was going to do it anyways in the show notes, but I just want to name it to involve you in the conversation. So if you have not been paying attention, the island of Puerto Rico is once again underwater. There is a very long fucking history of colonization globally and current by the United States. So that being said, Unfortunately, it is not getting, as it never does, enough media attention. There are a lot of organizations. If you are on my newsletter mailing list, you got a bunch of them in my stories. I've actually reposted some of the stuff Elizabeth has posted and other folks have posted, but you need to be paying attention. So go into the show notes. There's gonna, I'm going to repost the orgs. They are vetted that you can donate to or volunteer with to, to support. But as Elizabeth is actually Puerto Rican, I wanted to just give you the opportunity, obviously, if there is any like specific orgs that you're like, yeah, like this one is the one that I really rock with or anything that you wanted to just say about it. Listen, I've just been sending money everywhere. (laughs) Yeah, basically. But it's it's always, especially when it comes to the island of Puerto Rico, it's the grassroots stuff. So there is, she's a journalist. Her name is Bianca. I've never heard anyone say it out loud. It's it's G R A U L A U. I'm imagining it's like Growl Lao or something like that. Mm-hmm. That's who I follow to get like the real mm-hmm. news about what's going mm-hmm. on on the island. And so she's she's always going to have links to stuff like that. There was a really great post that they included me in at We All Grow Latina on Instagram. And Tayer Salud is one that I sent money to. Like it is. It's it's been in my stories. 
I haven't created a highlight, but I will create a highlight before this episode goes up because at the time we're recording it, like the hurricane, it, it hasn't even been a week. So yeah. we've all just kind of been like sharing and posting and sending money and, yeah. you know, yeah. checking in on my family and they still don't have electricity yeah. and like, what yeah. the hell are they doing? But that's the most important thing when it comes to a lot of things, but especially Puerto Rico. Don't send your money to FEMA. Certainly don't give it to any anything of and or connected related to the government. Even my Alito is texting me. If you're sending money, check with us first, because a lot yeah. of money got taken by the government and misappropriated. Mm-hmm. So you really look for the, the grassroots, like the people that are like, we're going directly here. And the way you can always tell, they're so transparent. They're so transparent on their websites, their Instagrams. The other way you can tell is their websites and Instagrams usually kind of suck. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, they're not putting the funds towards like the branding. Yeah. Some of them yep. are decent, but like, you know, you can tell what's a real grassroots organization. And then yeah. here's the other thing. I, I sent money to one the other day that specifically focuses on the people in rural populations and LGBTQ populations who tend to be the Mm -hmm. most vulnerable in these types of situations. Um, There's an organization, my friend Christine Gutierrez was sharing that specifically is supporting mothers. Right. So, you know, whatever pulls on your heartstrings, you know, Mm -hmm. like whoever, whatever you want to kind of support, look at what the efforts, where they send their money and what they're doing. And then maybe you want to support the thing specifically that speaks the most to you, but it all really matters and it all really is important and helps. Thanks. And so if you didn't write any of that down, that's fine. By the time this comes out, there will be a highlight, it sounds like. Or at some point, there will be a highlight on Elizabeth's IG page. So you can always go there. But there will also be links in the show notes for y'all. All right, y'all. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Honored to be able to spend time with you and really looking forward to seeing you in Miami next week. Thank you. I knew it was going to be amazing. I love your questions. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> All right, y'all. Until next time. Toodles. All right, y'all. Thanks so much for tuning in. Rate, review, subscribe, like, share this podcast with all of your peoples. Follow me on Instagram. And you can always join me in community over at Podia. Until next time.